Let me give a disclaimer at the top of this message because I need to say it off the top. This is not going to be um, an easy message to, to give out because it's, it's, it's going to cut deep. The reason I say that is th- th- this is this is my family, and so I feel like the, the only way that we're going to grow as a family and hopefully those who are watching online can grow is if we have some, some truth, but truth that is honestly kind of basic and it seems just straightforward, but it's necessary. So that said, it, man, he's, he's going to talk about all of us going to hell. That's not what I'm doing. But I want us to raise the stakes of where we are, um, not just us, but anybody. Um, but anyways, so this message has two, two goals in mind. First, we identify ways that we can improve as a family. But second, there's some things that I'm going to talk about that I want us to be aware of that when these things start to show up, because they show up inevitably everywhere, then we have to avoid these at all costs. All right, so if you have your Bible, we're going to be in Matthew 22 today. Matthew 22. Matthew, first book of the New Testament, if you need to, if you need to know where it's at. Um, so I did a message, actually, the very first message I did here um, was on the idea of the greatest commandment and love and stuff like that. This is actually kind of a part two to that, but it, I'm going to basically review the stuff before that as well. But it's just a part two to that. Um, if you were here, then you'll know most people here were not here, so that, that's great because it won't sound like I'm repeating myself. All right, so before we read Matthew 22, we're going to be reading uh, verses 34 through 40. But before we do, I want to give you some context, okay? Because it seems quite random that Jesus goes from talking about marriage and the resurrection to the greatest commandment. Like, aren't all the commandments the greatest? There's 613, aren't they all the greatest? Well, there was a reason why they were having a discussion. So around somewhere between the first century BC to first century AD, the time is kind of, kind of fluctuates depending on who you ask, there were two schools of thought. One was known as Beit Shammai. One was known as Beit Hillel. Um, these, both of these guys had what were called yokes, which is the basically you, set, you go with Shammai, you take on his yoke, his theology, his way of seeing the world. You go with Beit Hillel, you take on his yoke. That's also the context, too, when Jesus says, take my yoke upon you, saying, follow me, take what I say to heart. So, these two, Shammai and Hillel, were very, very, very different. Shammai is what most of us would call conservative in terms of how he interprets the text. Then Beit Hillel was more liberal. I don't, and I'm not talking about politics, but I'm talking about theology. Liberal means you see things a little bit more loosely than you do if you're conservative. So let me give you some examples of some differences they had. Saying grace, we're going to start with something light. Beit Shammai said that if, so what they did is they prayed at the end of their meal, not at the beginning. We pray before we eat, they prayed after they eat. Yeah, right? It it makes more sense to pray after. We already ate. Bless the food that I've eaten, not bless the food I'm about to eat. You may not even eat it. Like, who knows? Anyways, (laughs) um, so Beit Shammai said, so, oh, let let me give one more context. I'm so sorry. I didn't write this in my notes. So they would have somebody designated to pray each night at the ending prayer. There'd be one particular person that would pray each night. It would switch to the next person in the household the next night. The idea came up, or the question came up, what if the person that was designated to pray leaves and doesn't pray? Beit Shammai said, if they don't say grace at the end of the meal, we must wait here until they come back, however long it takes. Could you imagine if a person didn't come back? You're just sitting there for hours and hours and hours and hours, days, Beit Hillel said, that that is crazy, that's ridiculous, just have somebody else pray. You see how there's such a difference between the two? One's a lot more like, this has got to happen. One's like, no, it's not that big of a deal. Let's get another example. White lies. The example that was presented was, if you have a bride on a wedding day, if you're seeing the bride from the third person, I'm not making this up, I can't make this up, if they are unattractive, do you tell them that they're unattractive? Do you say, man, this girl, she messed up? Or do you actually say she's, do you lie? Beit Shammai said, you should never lie for lying's a sin. So you tell her how she looks. Beit Hillel said that all brides are beautiful on their wedding day. 
That's kind of a cop out, right? All brides are beautiful. Which is, hey, I like that answer a lot more. What about Hanukkah? We don't celebrate Hanukkah here, but let me just, I'm going to use this as an example. Um, so, on Hanukkah, the debate was when they light the menorah, do they start with one candle lit and then light a new one every night, or do they start with all of them lit and take one out every night? Beit Shammai said that you should light all of them first and then decrease each successive night. The reason was, was they called it a law of similarities. So the, there was another law under Sukkot where you would sacrifice 70 oxen, starting at 13 and then descending each day down to seven, ultimately totaling 70. So we said because we do it that way with Sukkot, we should do the same thing for Hanukkah. Beit Hillel said that we should start with one and work our way up to the seven because the general rule of halakha, which is the, the practice of the Jewish people, is that one increases holiness rather than decreases. Now, let's get to a little bit more, um, little bit more serious topic. Divorce. Is divorce okay? If so, when? Beit Shammai said that the man may only divorce his wife if there's been a serious transgression. She cheats, she you know, does something harmful to him, anything like that. Beit Hillel, if you want to know how loosely he was with this, Beit Hillel said, and I quote, if your wife burns your bread, you may divorce her. I'm so glad that like, here in America, we, we, don't, we, we value marriage so much more. That was a joke. Some people are like, what? It's not, we don't value it. What about Torah study? Beit Shammai believed that only those who were Jewish or only admitted students can study Torah. Beit Hillel said that anyone and everyone should study Torah in an expectation that they would repent and become worthy one day to study Torah. Now, I say all of that to lead up to this big one that we're talking about today. They had a conversation on the greatest commandment. Because here's the thing, with 613 laws, you're bound to have them clash. So let's, let's just give an example that's mentioned elsewhere in the Bible. If, let's say a donkey, your na- let's say that you walk by, you see your neighbor's donkey fall into a pit. Well, under the law, you're supposed to go and help your neighbor get the donkey out of the pit. That's a law. But what if it's the Sabbath? Right? So like, if it's the Sabbath, what do you do? And so they would argue, what is the greatest commandment? Because if we are faced with that kind of dilemma, what law goes above the other? So they both agreed on the greatest commandment, which is the Shema, which is Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, which says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all of your strength. These commands I give you today are to be on your hearts and press them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk on the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on your door frames of your houses and on your gates. They agreed that is the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. The problem that they ran into was the second greatest commandment. Shammai said that the second greatest commandment is to obey the Sabbath because the Sabbath is the only thing that the Lord called holy in creation. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Hillel said, you are to love your neighbor as yourself. This is found in Leviticus, I believe it's 19 if I remember correctly. So that's the context. So when they're at, this is a question they would ask all the time, which yoke are you under? Are you under Beit Hillel or are you under Beit Shammai? So they come to Jesus in Matthew 22, and let us read. Um, I'm actually starting in verse 35. And one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he, Jesus, said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all of your mind. So agreeing on the Shema. Verse 38. This is the greatest and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commands depend all the laws and the prophets. So, Jesus sides with Hillel. Doesn't sound that awesome, right? This sounds pretty, okay, cool. Why is that important? So, let me give you a more practical example, one that we may can relate to. 
Let's say that I am not, I'm not Jewish, so I don't have to use that as an example. I'm actually not Jewish. And let's just say, for example, is anybody here actually Jewish? No? Okay, that'd have been cool, but I guess not. We'll use Isaiah. Let's say Isaiah is Jewish. Um, actually, let me do it the other way around. This will make more sense if I do it the other way around. I'm Jewish. You're not Jewish. Let's say Isaiah invites me to his house to eat a meal. And he prepares the greatest pork you've ever, ever could have possibly imagined. Bacon, got some ham going, got some bread and all, awesome, awesome stuff. Because he has no idea at this point that I'm Jewish. But then I show up and he places the plate in front of me. Do I eat and break the, the law on kosher? Or do I say no, thus not being a host that is passionate about, I'm sorry, a guest that's not passionate about my host. In this culture, your guest is more important than your children. Like they treated guests with the highest respect. There is nobody, like if you, if you go to any house in Israel, I've not been to Israel, but this, I've heard many people say this. If you go to someone's house in Israel and you're their guest, they value you over themselves. Like you are the most important part of their home. So, in this case, do you choose to not love or do you choose to break the law? Well, what Jesus is saying here, in this case, it is better for me to eat and show love to my host than to not eat, thus disrespecting my host. Does that make sense? We following along? All right, so we're going to be hanging out on these commands today. This is going to be the most basic message probably you'll ever hear, but it's also a wake-up call because I, I wanna, I'm going to show you the stakes of some of the stuff that Jesus said. So we're going to start with the Shema. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your strength. How often do we actually think about this? Because this was the most important thing to the Jewish people. They would say this twice a day. That, that, that Deuteronomy passage that I read, they would quote that twice a day, at the morning and at the evening. Every single day. I, be, I believe they still do, if I remember correctly. But it is the most important thing. And yet, how often do we think about that basic command, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength? And do we even realize how big of a deal that command is? Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. Let me ask some more probing questions. Maybe this will help you answer the question. What do you spend the most, most of your time thinking about? Better yet, what is the first thought that comes to your mind when you wake up? Is it work? Man, I got a lot of stuff to do today. Is it school? Maybe it's goals that you have in your life. Maybe it's a relationship. But how, how many of us can truly say that when we wake up in the morning, the first thought is, God is so good. I love God. How often do you have to remind yourself to think about God? This is convicting. I'm telling you, when it gets busy, it's really easy to be like, man, God's great, but I, got, I really got a lot to do today. But how many times do we have to just pause and say, I remember the Lord? What do you spend most of your time doing? When you're at home, let's, just, let's use tomorrow. We're off tomorrow, most of us. When you, get, when you go home, what do you do? Do you cut on, most of us probably cut on our TV, watch Netflix, watch a series. Maybe we go to Instagram or Facebook. I don't even know if many people use Facebook anymore. Facebook's kind of skedaddling, but it's still there a little bit. People are watching Facebook right now. I noticed that on the prayer night, by the way, there was like, there was like three people who watched the Facebook one, but everybody else goes to the app. So Facebook, I don't think, is, is really making that much of a... Uh, statement. But anyways, TikTok, this is for the younger generation. I know it's for me. When you start watching one TikTok, here's the cool thing about TikTok. And by cool, I mean not so cool. You watch a video, you scroll. Watch a video, scroll. Watch a video, scroll. And it is endless. I'm telling you, you watch 10, 15, before you know it, 45 minutes has passed and you have no idea where that time went. It's the truth. I'm guilty of it. I'm guilty of it. What about YouTube? What about planning your future? How, how much of your time do you spend planning your future? Where does your money go? Do 
Does coming to church feel like a chore to you? This is a big one, okay? This is a big one. How many people wake up on a Sunday morning and say, ugh? Or how many people actually come to church and are like, I cannot wait to see what God has in store at church today. I can't wait to see my family. I can't wait to grow in the Lord. I promise we're going somewhere with this, but these are just, I'm just trying to get you to think. Does intimacy with God feel like a chore? Do you have to figure out how to fit God into your day? Like, do you have to wake up and be like, man, like, I got to get ready. I got to do this. I got to do this. And man, I just, I don't have time to read my Bible. Or I'll just pray on my way to work. Or I'll just, you know, I'll just sit down and I read a couple verses of my Bible, check that box and call it a day. How difficult is it for you to do your disciplines? We've been talking about them on Tuesday. How difficult is it for you to pray, for you to worship, for you to, uh, to read your Bible? These things are like thereof. Don't gain or lose favor or love from God, which we have to get way away from this idea of a transactional relationship anyway. This is not what this is about. Because God already said, what he said about you is firm. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. There's nothing that you have to do to earn more from God. But these things are simply signs of a heart that's been captured by God. Let me use a, married, a marriage, for example. I'm not married, so I can't use myself, obviously. But let's just use Tim and Hannah. I don't think that Tim has to wake up every day and be like, man, like I really don't want to talk to Hannah and goodness, I, I got to go and, man, I got to buy her lunch today. Man, like, I just want to buy something for myself, man. Like, man, and how often does he have to think about, you know, loving his wife? How often does he have to think about showing love for his wife? And yet we look at God as if it's something totally different. Like, oh, well, we can just, you know, be casual with God and whatever. But God calls us the bride of Christ, and yet we treat him just like he's some acquaintance that we just met off the side of the road. Think about friendships. How often do you have to think about the friends that you have? Like it's, it's e- it is so easy to love those who are closest to you, but why is it so difficult to love God? Not doing these things could be a sign that you may not love God as much as you think you do. So let me ask you a question. Who or what sits on the throne of your heart? Because here's the thing. Like, for those who have been captured by Jesus, you don't have to convince them to go deeper. There's no convincing. Me doing a message like this would be totally synonymous to be like, I get I, I already do that. Like, you're telling me something I already know. And yet, it's necessary because in our church culture today, not just this one, but everywhere, We make this so casual that we can put anything we want on the throne of our heart except God. Because if God becomes the throne of our heart, then we become radicals. People in the South, Josh talked about this last Sunday. Everyone, if you ask anybody, I love God. I love him so much. Man, man, I love Jesus. But show me your fruit. The Bible says you, Jesus himself said, you know a tree by its fruit. If you say you're an apple tree and start producing bananas, there's something wrong. Amen. If you say you love God and yet you are producing nothing, do you really love God? So really think about this again. How often do you have to force yourself to do what should come natural as a follower of Jesus? Prayer should come natural. Reading and listening to the Bible should come natural. Giving should come natural. Serving should come natural. Worship should come natural. It shouldn't be something that we have to be like, man, I got to force myself to do this. If you truly are in love with God, as much as you say you are, you don't have to worry about how you can fit God into your day, but rather you have to start worrying about how can I fit my day into God? If God is the center of your life, everything else has to sit around it. It has to work with your relationship with God. And yet we are so, so often, we put other things on the throne and say, I'll get to God when I get to God, but I got to do this right now. 
when it should be the other way around. I'm going to worship God, and if I have time for this, I'll get to it later. These are all important questions if we're going to gauge where we are. So let me, let me just say this. I believe that Christianity in the West that we've been given has a watered-down love version of the love of God or love for God. How do I know this? Look at the focus of the church now. Had it not been for dream, I'm, as God is my witness, had it not been for dream, I would have left the evangelical church. I would have been gone because I am frankly embarrassed of the way that things are. I'm embarrassed. Knowing what we know about Jesus or even the apostles, what would he think about the church today? If Jesus walked into the room right now, what would he say? This has, been, this has been burning in my heart these last few weeks. If Jesus showed up the way that he showed up in the Gospels, what would he have to say about the church in the West? What would he say? Because think about it. What was the church founded on? Primarily, it was founded on followers worshiping Yahweh on the other side of what Jesus accomplished. And then the secondary was to preach the real good news. What is the good news? The good news, or the euangelion, is the pronouncement of a new king and a new kingdom. It's not pray these words and you'll go to heaven. It's not, not try to lead people away from all the, it's There's a new king and a new kingdom. That's the gospel. There, listen, I hate to break it to you. The gospel of Jesus wasn't the first gospel. There were gospels before. There was gospel of Alexander the Great. There was a gospel of Caesar. And both of them said, there's a new king, and let's just use Caesar, new king, Caesar, new kingdom, Rome. You either obey or you die. And what, it, and what these Christians did is they showed up and said, I know you say that, but there is actually a new king, and it's not Caesar, it's Jesus. And the kingdom is the kingdom of heaven that he brings. Sorry, Caesar, you're not king. That's why they died. It's not because that they sang worship loud enough. It's not because that they were, you know, praying and checking off their daily Bible reading every day. It was because they were literally pronouncing to the world that there is a new king, Jesus, and a new kingdom, heaven. But what is the focus now? One author called the church now a church that sells water by the river. So think about this for a second. Let's just say the stage is the river of God. The church of today is taking domesticated products, scooping up water, and selling it by the river, saying, here's what you need, when they could just simply jump in. How do we know this? Because the focus is to get more attendees. We need more people. We need more people. We need more people. We need more people. We need more social media followers. I know this sounds crazy, but I'm telling you, it's, it's the truth. Go look at church's social medias and you'll see them say, follow our page, follow our page, share it. Getting more fame for the pastor. Getting more money, not for the right reason, but for themselves and what they're building, the platform they're building. The church today is focused on only being relevant getting out on time. I saw a video recently, and I was telling Isaiah about this this morning. I saw a video. It was, there were two pastors that were sitting in front of each other, and they were talking about how long a church service should be. And they were saying that, um, one pastor said that it would be really cool if the church would start putting up, during the countdown, how long the church service is going to be. We're going to be out in an hour and 15 minutes. And the other guy said, you know, somebody did that one time, and I didn't like the church afterwards. And he was like, why? And I thought it was going to be a good response. He said, I didn't like it because I was actually there for two hours instead of an hour and 15. I am not making this up. Are you kidding me? We've already been here an hour and a half, and we're just getting started. Sorry, everybody. We're just getting started. But we are so obsessed with getting out on time and making sure people get to lunch on time that we treat the church as though it's just some place that you come and check boxes. Come here for an hour, you'll check your box. Come here for an hour, we'll make sure that you have all your boxes checked. We'll make sure that we plug you into our system so that you can say that you served this week. Is this really what Jesus commissioned us to build? 
Is this really his bride? Did he die for this? Because if so, I don't want it. If he died to domesticate church, I don't want it. It's not what I'm interested in. I will find something else. Because I am not about to join a system that's exactly the same as the world around us. What is the point of the church? What would be the point of the early church if they showed up and said, Caesar is king and Rome is the kingdom? They'd be like, of course, we've been saying that for years. And yet, that's exactly what the church is saying. They're not showing up preaching Jesus. They say Jesus, and yet they're preaching their platform. There's a new king and a new kingdom. The king is our church. The kingdom is our mission statements, our belief statements. Look how passive Christians treat worship. Let's get a bit personal. This is going to hurt some feelings. I don't care, though. I'm, I'm, listen, I'm not, I'm not filtering myself today. Sorry, you guys. Last week, we had to literally tell people to stand up and engage in worship. Last week, we were, we were up here worshiping. We were going in. And before you know it, I hear Josh say, can everybody just stand up? And I looked up, and the whole room was sitting except for a few people. I'm, I'm sorry, but if, if that's how passive we're going to treat worship, that, that, it's pathetic, if I'm being honest with you. We're not here to just sit and listen to three songs and call it a day. We're here to worship the King of Kings. People literally died for this thing, and yet we're sitting. I'm not encouraging you to pretend, but what I am encouraging you to do is start to learn to love God. Because, listen, what is the point of being here if you don't want to worship? Just, just stay home. At least then you'll be authentic. I'm sorry. If, if, listen, if you have no desire to be here and you don't want to engage in what we have going on, I'm not calling our church the only thing out there, but I'm saying that we're here to worship God and we're here to go deeper than we've ever been before. And if you're not here for that, then this may not be the place for you. Don't, I mean, listen, we don't want you to come in with masks but we want you to come in authentic, start to love the Lord, and begin to engage with us. Don't be like, oh my God, I'm just going to come in, I'm going to check some boxes. If you're coming here to check boxes, you're going to leave pretty disappointed because we don't, probably don't have many boxes for you to check. We want you to come in here as yourself, worship God, and go out and do your thing. But if, if listen, if, if you don't want to be here, be authentic. Stay home. I hear crickets right now. Look at how quickly we sell out what God is doing in us for a relationship. I have seen this countless times where people would be so, so hardcore into what God is doing. They get a boyfriend or girlfriend, see ya. They're gone. It's happened in this church before many times. I, I, I'm not going to call, I'm not going to call anybody out, obviously, but it's it has happened here where people will be so on fire for Jesus, they'll get a relationship with somebody, and then suddenly they're gone. What happened? There's a new king on their throne. New king in a new kingdom, a new gospel. My girlfriend or boyfriend. And it doesn't satisfy. Look how many people spend money on things that they just don't need, to satisfy something in themselves that only God can satisfy. How many times do we buy things and hope, hoping that they satisfy us when that spot that we're trying to fill is only God? Matthew 6 says, For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Where is your money going? I know we don't like talking about money in the church, especially when people look at it wrong, but where does our money go? Because that says a lot about where your heart is. Jesus' words, not mine. Lukewarm love is the poison of our generation. People simply don't have God on the throne of their hearts. What does Jesus, what does Jesus himself say about those who are lukewarm? That he will spit them out of his mouth. It is Jesus' preference that you be ice cold than be lukewarm. Why? Because you're authentic. So what does it mean to truly love God? For me, I think of Philip. 
So, in Philip, to give you kind of a background of Philip's story, I'm not going to go into all of it. If you ever ask me about a sermon Marty Solomon did on, on Philip, and I'll send you the link. It's so good. Um, essentially, Philip is one of the disciples of Jesus. He's known as uh, Philip the Apostle or Philip the Evangelist, depending on what part of Scripture you're reading. Uh, Philip reached out to those who were the marginalized. If you look at everywhere in Scripture where he's at, you see people who are Gentiles coming to Philip asking to see Jesus. So Philip was the bridge between the Gentiles and Jesus. And so Jesus says in John 14, I've gone to prepare a place for you. And in this, he's talking a lot to Philip. And, you know, a lot of times we hear that and think, you know, he's going to prepare heaven for him. And Josh did a whole message on this. And I think that this has two meanings. I think one, it could mean he's going to prepare a place for you in his house. But also, think about what happened shortly after Jesus said this. He went to the cross and died. I go to a place, and I prepare a place before you. What is Jesus saying? Maybe he's just saying, I'm going to prepare a place. I'm showing you what's going to be happening to you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. How do we know this? Every disciple died. Everyone. All right. So Philip was in a a place called Heropolis. That's where he ended up having his church, was in a place called Heropolis. It's in modern-day Turkey. So here's how Philip dies. This 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 is what the love of God looks like. Philip was brought to the city gate. He was hung upside, this is what church history tells us, he was hung upside down by a chain that passed between his Achilles tendons. Then the Romans brought his daughters out and they left him just out of reach of his daughters. So imagine this is his daughters. He's right here. And while they were there, they did very horrible things to those daughters, and they told Philip that if you just give up this Jesus thing, if you just stop preaching this message of this new king in a new kingdom, if you stop talking about Jesus, then we'll save your family. Church history also tells us that his daughters in that moment, in their dying breath, were begging Philip not to give up Jesus. And then Philip after all of his daughters were killed one by one, Philip was then crucified. Jesus went to the cross, not just so Philip didn't have to, he went to show Philip how to die on the cross. That, my friends, is love. How many of us, really, really, listen, we're so we put ourselves in Philip's shoes all the time in this story and say, I would do the same thing. Would you? Would you really? If your kids were being beaten, molested, raped right in front of you, and the only thing that you had to say was, Jesus is not Lord, how many of us would say that to save our family? And yet Philip said, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't. I heard in this same message that I was just recommending, one thing he said that hit me like a freight train. He said, we often treat Jesus like a mascot rather than our Lord. We stamp Jesus' name on everything we do, and yet we're not willing to follow him and keep him on the throne. Lord means master. Master. Master means that he is in control of every part of your life. He isn't sitting, he isn't just sitting in the front seat of the car that you're driving. He's actually the one driving the car. That's what it means to have him as Lord. Something has to change. We have to stop living domesticated. We have to start living wild and free. That is our calling, to live wild and free with Jesus, to stop living this domesticated church thing that we go to every Sunday. We might as well shut the doors if we're just coming here to check boxes because that is not at all what Jesus died for. I want to transition a little bit and talk about love for oneself. 
So the second command was love. The, the first command was love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second was love your neighbor as yourself. A lot of times we kind of overlook that as yourself, but what Jesus is saying, if you are going to love others, you are only going to be able to love them as much as you love yourself. Otherwise, you're not going to know how much to love others. Love your neighbor as yourself. If I don't love myself at all, then you don't love your neighbors at all. So let's talk about love for oneself. I want to look, I want to look at two different levels of love to work our way into the, uh, the, towards the end. One is what I call accountable love. I would argue that this is the love that all of us have for ourselves. How do I say that? You don't have to ask yourself about your intentions when you take money out for your needs. You don't provide for yourself only when it's convenient to do so. You don't feed yourself just to check a box that you did something good for yourself. You don't give something, or I'm sorry, you don't give yourself something to drink just so that people see you doing it. You don't give yourself shelter so you don't feel bad about yourself. You don't wait for you to act in order to get something nice for yourself. You just do these things because they're things that you need for survival and things that you just do for yourself, right? We don't have to ask ourselves about that. I don't have to ask myself to buy clothes when all my clothes rip and break. I don't have to ask myself to put a tank of gas in my car. I just do it because I love myself. I'm accountable to myself. But the word that's used is agape in these passages. And agape raises the stakes because agape love is unconditional, preferential love. Agape love swallows accountable love and becomes a higher standard. So it's the same thing, but to a higher degree. It includes accountable love's traits, but it throws in feeling genuine, unconditional love for the object of this love. So, to give you a bit of my story, I don't really talk about this a whole lot. I, I used to see myself so low to God. I had, and this is something, if I'm being honest with you, it's something I still battle, is this idea of comparison. Because I see all the people around me Hey guys, I see all the people around me, like let me just use this modern day as an example. All my friends around me are getting married and yet I'm single. And so it's easy for me in that moment to be like, man, there's something wrong with me. I can't seem to draw any attention. Same thing growing up with my calling, like something that I've always wanted to do my entire life is what I'm doing right now. I love teaching, I love preaching, things like that. And yet everybody around me is doing the things that I wanted to do and nothing's happening for me. So it's easy for me to look at myself and be like, man, I just don't like myself. If I, if, apparently God doesn't like me. God's playing some sick game with my life. Apparently he doesn't like me very much. Whether I said it aloud or not, I thought that God did not love me because of how low I saw myself. I loved myself, but I didn't like myself. However, nothing, in my, nothing changed my life more than when I realized how much God loved me. And when Isaiah, like, it's like he was reading this message today when he was saying what he was saying about God's love. It's so true. I want to actually read you the lyrics to a song. This is my favorite song of all time. It's called Out of Hiding. We've done this song many times. But I want you to listen to these lyrics. And this, this is what changed my life is seeing that this is how God feels about you and me. Listen to the lyrics. Come out of hiding, you're safe here with me. There's no need to cover what I already see. You've got your reasons, but I hold your peace. You've been on lockdown, and I hold the key. Because I loved you before, you knew it was love. I saw it all, still I chose the cross You were the one I was thinking of when I rose from the grave. Now rid of your shackles, my victory is yours. I tore the veil for you to come close. There's no reason to stand at a distance anymore. You're not far from home. The second verse says, I'll be your lighthouse when you're lost at sea. I will illuminate everything. There's no need to be frightened by intimacy 
Just throw off your fear and come running to me. And then the bridge says, Oh, as you run, what hindered love will only become part of your story? And then it ends by saying, you're almost home now. You're almost home to me. That's how God feels about you. There's no conditions to it. God's not waiting for you to do the right things. He's not waiting for you to go to church a certain amount of times, to have a certain amount of scripture memorized, to believe a certain theology. It's just simple. God agapes you. He loves you unconditionally. Unconditionally. No matter where you've been, no matter how far you've run, you're still his favorite. The question is, do you see yourself that way? If only you knew just how fascinated God was with you. God stood face to face with my insecurity and said, no, that's not you. You may see yourself this way. That's not you. You may see yourself as broken. I've put you together. You may see yourself as an addict. Nah, not anymore. You may see yourself as lost. You're found. You may see yourself far, but you're actually home. If this is how God feels about you, knowing more about you than even you do, then why don't you feel the same way about yourself? This love is the highest standard of love, and this is the kind of love that you need to have for yourself, and as we're going to see in a minute, for others. You've been handcrafted by a perfect God with the likeness of that same imperfect God. To be insecure is not to insult yourself, but to insult the craftsman. You hear me? To say that I don't like what looks in the mirror, you're not insulting yourself. You're insulting the one who actually knit you together in your mother's womb. So if you are insecure, then you're insecure about God's craftsmanship, not your own self. For some... Maybe it's hard to love yourself because you aren't where you need to be yet or where you want to be yet. Listen, I have the key to freedom from fear of the future. Live in the present. Period. There is a, there's a paradox to life. This is, this is, we're going to get a little bit philosophical for a moment. It's crazy how the only way that you're going to see a future that you have in mind or that God has in mind is to first live in the present. It is impossible for you to reach a future if you're trying to do things that can only be done in the future. So if I have to go to work on Tuesday, how foolish of me would it be to go to work today for work that I have to do Tuesday when I'm actually on the clock? Does it make any sense? I actually heard someone say that future tasks can only be done by future you. Present you can't do future tasks. So why are we worrying? Listen, I'm, I'm going to free some people here today. Some of you are like me, and you heard growing up, God's got, a, got a, a calling for you, and your calling is to preach. I'm gonna, I love you guys so much to tell you this. God's simply telling you what your career is going to be in the future ain't in here. It's not in here. I'm sorry to tell you, but what is in here is don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough worry of its own. That's Matthew 6, 34. Jesus said, do not worry about tomorrow. Why? Because you're not guaranteed tomorrow. It should be a basic elementary idea. If we are worried about something that isn't going to even happen yet, we are missing everything that's happening today. What do we have right now? We are here together worshiping God. If you are sitting here thinking about what you have to do for the week, then there's something wrong. You're, and I do the same thing. I'm not saying I'm perfect. We all do this. But the only way for you to get rid of the fear of the future is to stop dwelling on the future. Same thing with your past. You cannot change what happened yesterday. There's nothing you can do to change what happened. What you can do is live present different than you lived in the past if you don't like what was in the past. This is elementary stuff. The only thing that's guaranteed is the present. The only thing. Some treat this idea as some treat the idea of Jesus' calling as higher than Jesus himself and imply that Jesus by himself isn't enough, so this must be thrown in. How many of you have heard stuff like that? Where it's like, Jesus is great, but man, he's got a big calling on your life. 
And that, they, they talk about it as if that's what's going to fulfill you. But if we would get to the place where Jesus himself is enough, then who cares what happens in the future? Who cares what job I have? Who cares if I don't make it to see next year? All I know is today I have Jesus and that's enough. That's how our mind should be. But Matt, doesn't God know the desires of our heart and want us to live in that? Well, let's get philosophical again. How do you know what you want? In fact, how do you even know that what you want is actually what you want whenever it's time to get it? What if the thing you want is something that, if received, would actually be something that you dread? Have you allowed God to shape even your wants and desires? Maybe that's why you're not where you want to be. It's because God's trying to do something now to shape you for the future. Think about, let's get practical. As a kid, I wanted to be a professional football player. I can say with confidence now that I have zero desire today to be a football player. Why? Because I didn't dwell on the fact that I've got to be a football player because God put the desire in my heart. God actually, what he does, it's great, is through everything that happens in your life, he begins to shape your wants and desires. What you want today may not be what you want next week. So how bad of a God would he be to give us something that he knows we're going to hate later? So instead of worrying about, oh, God knows the desires of my heart, i got to pursue what I want today in hopes of getting something in the future, but instead today, live in what you have today, trust that God is shaping everything for your good, and be satisfied in Him, and then your love and your wants and all that stuff will all fall into place within time. It's elementary stuff, but if you want, if you want to stop thinking about the future, stop thinking about the future. There's freedom in that. We're not called to dwell in the future. There's not one place. Listen, I'm not, and listen, I'm not saying that we shouldn't make plans for the future. We shouldn't plan Christmas dinners and all. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that we shouldn't be so worried about the future that we totally miss what's happening in the present. If you don't have a proper love for yourself, you will never be able to truly love others. Something must change. Now, we're going to go into love your neighbor. I don't have many pages left, so we're getting close. The word that's used for neighbor is the word placion in Greek. And that word means those whom you reside with or those in your city. Just to give context. This is one that is simply not talked about much anymore, loving your neighbor. This is, I'm telling you, it's a basic concept, but this is just not talked about anymore to this degree. People assume in the conservative church nowadays, that talking about a love for others makes you liberal. If you talk about love, then, oh, oh my gosh, he's signing up with all this stuff for, you know, critical race theory and all this stuff, and they start throwing all these labels on you, saying you're this because you're actually just loving people. Can we pause for a moment and realize how ridiculous labels are? Do we know how destructive labels are? If you believe one thing, then you're this. If you believe this, then you're this. If you live this way, then you're this. Labels, I'm telling you, they are the most destructive thing ever. I can't tell you how many times I've talked to somebody about something in the Bible, and they're like, oh, you must be a, a, one of those universalists. And I'm like, what? That's not even what I said. Like, are you even in a conversation right now? You must not be Calvinist. You must be one of those liberals. Like, bro, like... I'm just wanting to love God and love others. I'm not interested, because listen, here's the thing. With every label, and I think all of us can agree, every label is always not going to fit exactly on us, right? There's always going to be something that we disagree with. So how destructive is it if somebody gives you a label that doesn't fully apply to you? It's destructive. There's only one label that God gave us, and it was Tov Mayad, very good. That's the only label that matters. All God's people said, amen. All right, back to love. The entire ministry of Jesus was built on love. But here's the thing. Jesus' love looks a lot different than ours. Our love, our universal church, our love looks like giving someone a free pen at church and saying, God bless you when someone sneezes. God loves you. But Jesus' love looks like getting in the dirt with a woman caught in the act of adultery and standing in the gap between her and her accusers. Do you see the difference? It's a lot different. 
Jesus' love looks like becoming ceremonially unclean by touching a man with leprosy just so that he becomes healed. Jesus' love looks like forgiving his killers because they don't know what they are doing. Our love looks like letting someone cut in front of us at a grocery store so we feel better about ourselves. Really? Don't you dare confuse inconvenience with love. Just because you are inconvenienced does not mean you love someone. Jesus actually felt love. We fake love and think we are being holy. We show acts of love and acts of kindness because we have to. If you see, let me ask you this. Let's get practical. This is going to be hurtful, even for myself. If you have somebody that comes up to you outside that's homeless, let's just say, for example, you have a $20 bill and that's all you got. If he comes up to you and says, man, I need lunch and I don't have anything to get to eat. Is your response, (sighs) or is it, oh my gosh, thank you, Jesus, for an opportunity to love someone. Yes. Do you see the difference? I'm convicting myself. I do the same thing. I do the same thing. I am not declaring myself separate in this conversation. I do the same thing. I'm convinced that the church, particularly in the West, has abandoned the love of Christ altogether for others. Because, listen, we love those that give us money. We love those that serve us. We love those that share our social media posts. But how absent love is when we have someone come in that doesn't fit the status quo. I have been to countless, countless churches that would reject you and talk behind your back if you didn't look and act exactly like everybody else. If you didn't fit their status quo, you were rejected. Why? Because some people would come to me and talk about other people. I've been in it. I've been in it. And it is so unbelievably destructive. I've even seen churches kick people out for the lifestyle that they were living in. I've seen churches kick out people that said that they were gay. I've seen it. It happens. Also, I want to say this too. I'm not at all affirming any lifestyles, but isn't it weird that out of all the sins that we could chase in the church, we just attack homosexuality as though there's no other problem happening in the church? Like, they're, listen, hmm. The same pastors that are kicking these people out for being gay are going home and looking at porn on their computer. In Jesus' eyes, that's the same thing. How often do we put people who are gay in one camp, as in the unforgivable sin, and then we put everybody else with these little sins over here and say, they're still more holy, those people don't belong though. It's time that we change how we love people. What makes you think that you are so sinless that you have the right to say who's in and who's out? You see, the kingdom of God, there are no outs. It's a pretty embarrassing. It's pretty embarrassing that we sit and judge Pharisees and Sadducees in the Bible, and yet we are the spitting images of them. We are the exact same. We would have done the exact same. We would have, we would have persecuted Jesus the exact same way. Again, if Jesus walked, let's just give another example. You can think this in your heart. I know it's going to be easy to say you would, you would not think this way, but just think about it in your heart. Let's say Jesus walked in today, and he was surrounded by people that the church rejected. He had gay people on his left, homeless on his right, people of different skin color on another side, and all these people that we have rejected over small things, Jesus walks in with and looks at us and says, these are who you rejected you are more out than they are. What would we do? We'd probably say crucify him. And yet, Jesus came to show us that those who we thought are out are actually in. And those who to themselves think they're in are probably actually out. The very people that Jesus talked at and preached to were the religious, not the sinners. How many sermons can you find in here of Jesus persecuting a sinner? Zero. 
How many of these do you see where he's directing at the people of God saying, you have rejected the people, so I have come to show you that that way is not the way of God. Israel's calling from the get-go was to be a kingdom of priests for all of the nations, not to be one place where they can do everything themselves, but to welcome in everybody, to love the alien, the orphan, and the widow. That was the call of the original people of God. And yet it's foreign to us. I heard one pastor say uh, last week, he said, the greatest threat to modern Christianity in our churches is Jesus. If we allowed him to lead, teach, direct, and set the tone, he would dismantle 90% of what is done in his name. Ouch. The biggest threat to our church and modern Christianity isn't the gay people, isn't those who are, you know, sleeping with people they shouldn't be sleeping with before marriage. It's Jesus. Because we're living so contrary to him, and he would show up and just annihilate everything. He would flip tables in our church today, and yet we think we would do the same thing in his name, as though we're the ones who are holy. 1 John 4, 19-21 says, We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister, whom they have seen, cannot love God, whom they have not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. I said this the first time I I did a message like this. You cannot say that you love God if you don't love others. It do, love for God does not exist if you don't love others. It doesn't exist. If you hate your brother or sister, if you hate people, you cannot love God. Same vice versa. You can't say, I love people, if you don't also love God. It's the same thing. So let's go back to the two loves mentioned before when we talked about loving ourselves. Isaiah, you can actually go ahead and prepare while we talk about this. If we are to love others as ourselves, then think about what we said earlier. So let's talk about accountable love again. Think of the same exact examples as before. You don't ask yourself about your intentions when you take money out of your account for your needs. Similarly, you shouldn't wonder about others' intentions when you when they have a visible need that you can clearly meet. You don't provide for yourself only when it's convenient to do so. Similarly, you shouldn't wait until it's convenient to provide for others. You don't feed yourself just to check a box that you did something good for yourself. Similarly, you shouldn't feed others just to check a box that you did something good for them. You don't give yourself something to drink just so people see what you're doing. Similarly, you shouldn't give others something to drink just so people see what you're doing. Couple more. You don't give yourself shelter so you don't feel bad about yourself. Similarly, you shouldn't give others shelter so you don't feel bad about them. You don't wait for you to act right in order to get something nice for yourself. Similarly, you shouldn't wait until someone else acts right in order to get something nice for them. You just do these things because you know that there is a need and that these things are necessary for survival. Similarly, you just do these things because you know that there is a need and that these things are necessary for survival. But what did we say the kind of love was? It wasn't accountable love. It was agape love, which raises the stakes and swallows the accountable love. This means that we are to start loving people in a way that we actually feel, not just do. This means that when we sit down with people and talk to them, we're not just talking to them because we feel bad, but we're talking to them because we actually love them. How do we even get there? How do we start loving people? Hear their story. Call out the good in them in their story. Pray for them. Serve them. Sacrifice your own desires for them. It's that simple. It's, listen, it's the simplest message you probably will ever hear. 
But how far are we from the simple message of Jesus? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And yet I feel like in the West, we don't have any of those boxes checked. We're not, we're not good in any of those boxes. We don't love God the way that we should. We don't love ourselves the way that we should. We don't love others the way that we should. So what do we, what do, we do with all this? How do we actually begin to grow in this? It's simple. It's, we talked about this on Tuesday. It starts with being intentional in prayer. And when I say prayer, I don't just mean like, Lord, bless everybody in my life, amen. It's like call out people by name. And then, as, listen, as far as your love for God, ask God to light a fire in your spirit. He'll do it. God, satisfy me. He'll satisfy you. The problem is, is we don't even pursue. We just assume that we've gotten everything from God that we can, even though God's an endless, infinite, all-expansive God. And yet we're like, I got enough. But you don't. Because there's no fruit. There's no fruit. 